Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, just um, eHealth Initiative is doing a series on these webinars for privacy and security. And this is the second one in the series. We will be letting you all know when, when we are planning the next one. Today's webinar is, um, I love the title, HIPAA for Dummies. And not, not that you are, but it, it really takes some, uh, someone like our, our presenter today to really explain it and, and have people understand. And we hope that you really take advantage of, of um, today's call and ask, ask any questions. So um, today's speaker is our very own Alice Leiter, who's a lawyer, vice president, and senior counsel for eHealth Initiative. Um, uh, so just before we get started, a few housekeeping. Um, you'll notice on your computer that there's two, two areas for communicating with us. One is a Q&A, and we ask everyone to use the Q&A. Um, uh, uh, so that um, all the questions are in one location. The chat box is really for technical difficulties if, if you have any, if you can't hear or if you have any question um, specific to, um, uh, to, to one of us that, that you need some help with. Um, and we will be posting the slides on the chat box so that you know where to find them. So just, just in terms of e, the mission of eHealth Initiative, we really serve as the industry leader in convening um, executives that are multi-stakeholder. We've got payers, providers, uh, vendors, government, all, all areas interested in how health information technology is impacting healthcare. And we identify best practices um, that transform healthcare through the use of technology and innovation. And what we do with these um, is we add all of these to our resource page, which I will tell you about. We're very, very um, um, pleased that we've got such an amazing leadership council. This is a smattering of who helps to drive the, um, the direction of the eHealth initiative. Um, I, of course, I can't go through all the names, but you can see it's a wide variety of organizations, companies um, uh, that are very well known and respected. Um, these are also part of our, our eHealth initiative members that are part of our leadership and board. Um, currently, we're focusing on four different areas, value-based care, interoperability, privacy and security, and analytics. And you'll find the work that we're doing in each of these areas on our resource page. And if you have um, best practices or white papers that you would like to contribute, uh, please don't hesitate. Go to our resource page and uh, there you'll find an area where you can submit a posting. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so again, here are the, the resources, uh, the resource page, and um, uh, you'll find a lot of really, really good and helpful information on there. So on that note, I'm going to pass this over to our presenter for today, Alice. Thank you, Claudia, and thank all of you so much for joining us. We, we went back and forth on whether the name HIPAA for Dummies was too pejorative, um, because certainly all of you uh, who are nerdy enough to be interested in HIPAA are certainly not dummies. But um, it's sort of come to our attention recently as HIPAA has become a little bit uh, more of a topic in the news that there's some fundamental misunderstandings of what this law is and what it governs. And so I put together, I would say, a crash course that is um, really nuts and bolts here. So if you all are well enmeshed in HIPAA and want to know some nuances of updates to the law that have happened in the last 30 years or um, future regulations or detailed exceptions and issues, I would love to talk to you about those at some point. But this presentation is really going to be um, sort of the who, what, where, why, and when. Um, starting with the fact that HIPAA is spelled with two A's, not two P's. I can't tell you how many times I've learned that the hard way of our uh, spell check, but it stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which doesn't really seem like it has very much to do with health privacy, but that's where our health privacy uh, laws and regulations on the federal front really lie. It is important because it is the primary federal law that protects health information. There are other laws, of course, that do in some way protect uh, health information. And I, I don't have a slide on those, but I can just list some of them. There are uh, some federal uh, regulations that govern the um, use and disclosure of substance abuse information for people who are in federally funded treatment centers. 
there are um, a series of regulations known as the common rule that apply across a number of different agencies that govern research. Uh, there's FERPA, the Federal Education Rights and Practices Act. I don't have that in front of me, but that's the education uh, records law that sometimes touches health information because of course, student medical centers will have um, health information in, um, in their student records at some point. So there's sort of an overlapping complex Venn diagram, but really where the action is, is HIPAA. And it governs the permissible uses and disclosures of health information. Uh, disclosure meaning the sharing with or telling of or disseminating to of health information. And importantly, it's only health information that identifies the subject of the information. So of course, in 2020, there are millions and millions of pieces of aggregated data out there that have been stripped of identifiers. And that is not a HIPAA covered data set. It has to be individually identified. Identifiable. And it also covers only the information that was created, received, or maintained by, or is created, main, created, received, or maintained on behalf of healthcare providers, doctors, and health plans, uh, insurers. Um, it uh, is often cited as a very restrictive law. And if any of you currently work in or have worked in health centers or provider offices or, or other um, HIPAA covered entities, very often HIPAA is kind of thrown down as a red flag of, oh, we can't do that, or, oh, we can't possibly engage in this really important data sharing for healthcare purposes because of HIPAA. But as hopefully you'll see, hopefully I'll, I'll convey, it actually is a quite permissive law. And there's a camp of people who um, actually thinks that it's too permissive. So let's move on. Unfortunately, there isn't a cute little HIPAA on every, I mean, HIPAA on every slide, but just picture it in your head because that's really the only light <laughs> area of this whole presentation. The HIP the statute was passed in 1996, and uh, 1996 was when um, health information was starting to become um, increasingly electronic and medicine was starting to be more digitized. You all um, also probably know that it's sort of embarrassing how um, far healthcare has lagged behind in the kind of digital revolution, but HIPAA was a really big deal. Um, aiming to modernize the flow of information as it was becoming digital and trying to standardize the way that him, information was used in exchange. We won't go too into um, the standards for exchanging health information because they're, as you can imagine, quite technical, but it was an effort to um, try to get some consistency across the healthcare system so that information could be uh, shared with those who needed it more efficiently. The HIPAA regulations are where the real um, you know, meat of the matter is, and there are a number of them, and I'm going to uh, highlight four, but um, there, there's a lot of stuff that over the years has gotten um, lumped underneath HIPAA by way of a regulation. Regulations are those that implement the statutes. So the privacy, the HIPAA regulations that pro probably those in the healthcare system care the most about are the privacy rule and the security rule. For privacy pol policy people, um, the privacy rule is really the, the big game in town. And it applies, again, to providers who are, it's easiest to think of them as doctors or health centers or hospitals, clinics, health plans, uh, insurers and payers. And then this category um, of covered entities known as healthcare clearinghouses. And I've been doing HIPAA work for many, many years, and I still had to print something out that told me what healthcare clearinghouses are because they're sort of an obscure category of, of covered entities. Um, and I will just read this out loud. A healthcare clearinghouse is a public or private entity, including a billing service, repricing company, community health management information system, or community health information system that either processes or facilitates the processing of health information received from another entity in non-standard format containing non-standard data or receives a standard transaction from another entity and processes or facilitates the processing into non-standard format or non-standard data. And I'm laughing just because, I, I mean, I barely know what that means. I think for purposes of this webinar, we'll say that healthcare clearinghouses are sort of the least relevant of the big category of covered entities. They're probably very important in certain health systems. And I really apologize if any of you work at healthcare clearinghouses and think this is the most important thing, but really most often when HIP is talked about, it's really in these categories of providers and, and, and payers. Um, and the privacy rule sets the limits and conditions on the uses of disclosures that can be made of what is called in the rule protected health information or PHI without patient authorization. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but what, 
when a patient consents or an individual uh, consents to the use or disclosure of his or her health, health information, really anything is game. Um, but the point of the privacy rule is to say, how do we provide good care? How do we have a good health system? How do we use and share data that does um, identify a patient without their consent? And there are, there are numerous uh, conditions under which that can be done. The privacy rule also sets forth a lot of important individual rights, and there are whole nonprofits that are devoted to ensuring that people know about their HIPAA rights and that their HIPAA rights are um, actualized. And that includes a right to examine or obtain a copy of your health record and also to request corrections of it once you've seen it. And I'm sure we've all been in a situation where you want to see your full medical record, not just a printout from your doctor visit, but really now, I've been a patient of yours for 10 years. I want to see everything that you have. And that's your right under HIPAA. Unfortunately, in practice, it doesn't tend to be as easy as just getting texted or emailed a link or having something printed out. There's a, um, there are some time frames under the, the rule that govern how, how long it can be before, you, before your doctor is obligated to give it to you, like how much time they can take. And in certain cases, they'll charge you per page of your health record. But this right to see your own health information because it's yours is a really important tenant of HIPAA that sometimes doesn't get the attention it deserves. Then the security rule is uh, most relevant to um, vendors, to tech companies and to electronic health record vendors. And this is back to what I mentioned a little bit about the, HIP, the uh, origin of the HIPAA um, statute, which is to establish a set of national security standards for protecting health information. So once health information is in a system, it has to meet a number of very spe specific codes and specif specifications to keep them, uh, to keep that information safe. And even with respect to non-technical safeguards, there are some really detailed conditions under which health information must be stored up to and including things like a locked filing cabinet that has to be a certain number of feet or yards away from a public area. Um, because obviously, given that there is such sensitive health information contained in these um, doctors' uh, offices and, and computer systems and payers and insurers too, the security of this information is, goes hand in hand with its privacy. The next two regulations are um, very important, uh, maybe not again from a privacy policy standpoint, but on the next slide you'll see I outline uh, some high level things about the enforcement rule and the breach notification rule. Um, HIPAA went through a massive overhaul in 2009 with the passing of the stimulus legislation, and uh, there was a piece of the stimulus package known as the High Tech Act, and it really boosted the uh, civil and criminal enforcement of the HIPAA rules by um, really significantly overhauling the structure for civil monetary penalties for violations of HIPAA, and really vesting in the Office for Civil Rights within HHS, who's always had responsibility for enforcement of HIPAA, but they became sort of a, a bigger deal because suddenly the stick that they were wielding was quite, uh, it was not, not only bigger, but more painful from a financial standpoint. Um, and then the breach notification rule for all of you who've ever had to be an associate in a law firm that handles breaches is incredibly important because it um, lays out the detailed conditions under which people need to be notified if there's been a breach. And you probably see you know, all the time uh, headlines about big health systems that have been hacked or a security lapse. Sometimes there is kind of um, you know, <laughs> accidental and, and seemingly um, innocuous as leaving a computer in a car while you're at someone's soccer practice and the computer gets stolen and it turns out it has hundreds of thousands of patient health records or billing information on the computer. That happened while I was in practice. And then other times it's something that's more of a um, you know, malicious hack into systems, but there's a very detailed set of rules of who you need to call, when you need to notify, uh, both from an individual standpoint, but also um, state and local governments or even the federal government when there's been a breach and, and how you do that. So again, I'm happy to do as many of these webinars on the detailed regulations of HIPAA as possible for, to, to satisfy your interest, but I think for now we're mostly just going to focus on the privacy regulation. All right, so I might be beating a dead horse here, but it's just really important now that HIPAA is becoming more um, discussed to really understand its boundaries. It only covers covered entities, and covered entities are the healthcare providers, healthcare plans, and healthcare clearinghouses. And it only covers PHI, which is individually, individually identifiable health information held or transmitted by a covered entity or its business associate in any form or media. That includes electronic, paper, and oral. 
and individually identifiable is very broadly defined. Um, it's it's uh, any information that serves to expose a patient's identity, um, any aspect of a patient's physical or mental condition in the past, present, or future, any healthcare treatment and services provided, any payment made by the payment for the provision of care in the past, present, or future. And because this includes payments, uh, it really lumps in a lot of other criteria that can identify a patient. And that includes names, dates of birth, dates of death or treatment, social security numbers, telephone numbers, vehicle registration numbers, driver's license numbers, medical record numbers, credit card info, finger and voice prints, electronic images or photographs, examples of a patient's uh, handwriting or signature, and, and really anything that identifies a patient. It's very broadly defined. And then to the extent that HIPAA goes, goes wide, it's, under, it's in the context of these business associates, which is really just a contractor. And as you can imagine, in a very complex healthcare system, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of contractors to covered entities that, uh, that enter into a relationship with a provider or a payer to perform services on that covered entity's behalf. And very often those services in the health system will involve um, the handling of PHI. And the privacy rule applies to business associates, those contractors, just as it does covered entities. Next slide. Um, importantly, if you are not a covered entity, if an organization, if a company, if a um, agency is not a covered entity, any health information, even if it's individually identifiable, that is held or created by that person or company is not HIPAA covered data. And similarly, if there is data that is held by a covered entity that is not individually identifiable, it is not covered by HIPAA. Um, this is just sort of coming at the same thing that I said in the slide before from a different angle, but sometimes it's just as important to understand what's not HIPAA covered data and who is not a HIPAA covered entity as it is to understand who's covered by the law. Um, and importantly, once data has been de-identified and the privacy rule sets out a couple of conditions under which data will be certified as de-identified, meaning it really truly cannot identify an individual that it's, the sub that is its subject, it does not enjoy HIPAA protections any longer. Next slide. All right, so your data that you hold and generate is not covered by HIPAA unless you transmit it or share it with or give it to a covered entity. And this is really important because right now in this day and age, there is so much data that could arguably be thought of as health data that we as consumers, individuals, and patients create on our phone create via the, uh, the use of a wearable device, upload into an application on our phone, store on our computer. And the idea that that is protected because it is health information is just really sadly um, inaccurate and can even be dangerous because of the misunderstanding that because there's health data, because it's health data, uh, it's covered by HIPAA. It, it really isn't. So when you, um, as I said, store some sort of um, health information that you've received on your computer and save it there, not covered by HIPAA. If you use a calorie counting app or a fitness tracker or an application that tracks your period or your ovulation if you're trying or not trying to conceive, all of that, which is very, very sensitive data, absolutely individually identifiable, absolutely health information, it's not HIPAA covered. And as a result, it really and unfortunately enjoys very little uh, legal protection. I will not waste anybody's time by talking about my specific role at EHI, but this universe of non-HIPAA covered health data is a very interesting, very challenging area of health policy. And it's what I'm working on myself at HIPAA is what can we do to fill in the gaps between HIPAA, which is I've said a million times is uh, applies to a very specific type of entity and all of this broad, broad, broad universe of health data that really at this point is only really covered by kind of baseline expertise and force. So again, these app providers and the tech companies don't tend to be HIPAA covered entities in their own right. And an individual is not a HIPAA covered entity. And very often an individual will request that the, his or her provider or payer sends information either to an email address or a phone for personal use or so that you can upload some of that information that comes from your doctor into a really cool health management wellness app. But once it leaves your doctor, it leaves the protection of HIPAA. And that is just really something that's important to understand. All right.
Right. Business associates, again, muddy the waters a little bit just because they expand the entities covered by HIPAA beyond traditional covered entities. And so traditionally business associates do kind of, um, I don't know, grindy healthcare system things like claims processing or a data analysis or utilization review. Uh, lots of uh, insurers and payers contract with business associates to help implement their billing systems. But really a business associate can do anything that's on behalf of a covered entity. And um, the covered entity can hire a business associate for all sorts of purposes. And um, under the terms of uh, the agreement, um, that business associate then has access to um, protected health information. So that's why the business associate uh, provisions under the HIPAA privacy law have been strengthened a number of times since the law was written. Because now that there's so many other, as I was mentioning before, uh, apps, but also um, data analysis companies, data aggregators, this whole concept of big data that didn't need to exist. Business associates are instrumental in carrying out those huge widespread um, data, anal data analytic um, functions for, for healthcare providers and payers. And um, there being increasingly these uh, vast troves of data are being stored on big tech company platforms. And so whenever there's gonna be an exchange of PHI so the business associate can do its job, um, the two entities, the covered entity and the business associate, the contractor, have to enter into what's known as a business associate agreement, which is a contract. And it sets forth in great detail what the business associate is going to be doing, under what circumstances it is allowed to use PHI, under what circumstances it is not allowed to use PHI. And importantly, it makes very, very clear that once this business associate agreement has been entered into, all of the requirements and provisions of the privacy rule apply to the business associate the same way that they apply to a covered entity. So it's really like just an extension of the privacy rule and its, its, um, its uh, provisions to a, a larger subset of organizations pursuant to this very important contract. Next slide. Um, and so with respect to what does the privacy rule govern? Okay, it governs uses and disclosures. And there are two big categories of circumstances under which protected health information can be uh, disclosed. And if you don't fall within one of these one or two categories, the covered entity and its business associates cannot use or disclose PHI. And that is unless the privacy rule permits or requires such a use, or two, the individual who's the subject of the information or of course, if that individual is a minor or incapacitated in some way and has some sort of legal representative, that subject has to authorize the use in writing. And so again, you all have been to doctor's offices and you've filled out your HIPAA release and um, those are very important. There, as you can imagine, a whole cottage industry around trying to make individual authorization mean something so that an individual really does know what he or she is consenting to when that, si when that form is signed. But really the, the expectation is that you, we as patients feel that unless there's a permitted process by law, uh, a permitted purpose by law for which the information can be shared, or unless we have personally signed off, that information stays private and secure. Next slide. The big three permitted disclosures of health data under HIPAA that, um, that are most frequently talked about are treatment, payment, and healthcare operations, known in the biz as TPO. And the first one, treatment, is probably the easiest to understand. Of course, for the provision in, of, of healthcare or coordination or management of healthcare, uh, there is uh, interest to, in um, making that as smooth as possible, uh, the exchange of information. When your healthcare providers consult with each other, you want them to be able to share confidential patient notes with each other. You want uh, health care providers to be able to refer one patient to another. Really, in order to provide effective health care, there needs to be the ability for doctors to talk with each other without, at every step, having to get individual authorization. So treatment is a purpose uh, for data use and sharing under HIPAA that does not require individual authorization. And similarly, individual authorization is not required for uses and disclosures for payment purposes. Um, and you can think about all of the myriad ways that insurers need to get information from your doctors that have to do with um, obtaining payment or reimbursement, um, healthcare premiums, uh, providing benefits or determining coverage or eligibility for a particular service. Those conversations, that exchange of data also needs to happen without individual authorization or it would really grind things to a halt. So payment is another big umbrella category for 
um, disclosures that can be made without individual authorization. And then kind of the catch-all category, the broadest category, is known as healthcare operations. And sort of the highest level description of these is that healthcare operations are certain administrative, financial, legal, and quality improvement activities of a covered entity that are necessary to run its business and to support the core functions of treatment and payment. So some examples of these would include staff evaluations, case management, care coordination, um, you know, trainings that happen, uh, accreditation and certification, um, underwriting as it applies to health insurance or health benefits, um, fraud and abuse detection and compliance programs, really just sort of business operations and, and quality improvement exercises also are, are a, a category of activities that really comes up a lot uh, when you're working in health systems. So it's really business management activities of the provider that would require some disclosure of, of protected health information because it's relevant to one of those activities. That also is a category of disclosures that can be made without uh, specific authorization from the patient. And then there are a hefty handful of permitted uses or disclosures of health data under the privacy rule without patient authorization. And then those include those that are required by law, and that can be any law. Uh, it can be public health activities. So very often um, there are widespread um, uh, public health uh, um, initiatives that are going on, immunization pushes, um, there's an outbreak of something, there, there's a um, you know, natural disaster. Um, if it's a public health purpose, and again, all of these are defined in more detail in the, in the um, in the regulations, um, those can be uh, disclosures that don't require individual authorization. Very often in the case of abuse or neglect or domestic violence, um, a disclosure by a medical professional or payer will be uh, permitted without individual authorization if, in order to protect uh, the patient uh, who's in harm. Um, health oversight activities, same thing. This is sort of the high level operation of the healthcare system. Law enforcement purposes, very often there's a situation in which in order to effectively carry out a law enforcement activity, there needs to be uh, access to protected health information. Uh, decedents, sometimes in cases of organ or tissue donation. Uh, research is an important one, although as I said, there are all sorts of, all, of other important uh, regulations governing research. Uh, serious threat to health or safety, essential government functions and workers' compensation. And again, I don't have the, um, the regulation in front of me right now, but all of these have um, more detail associated with when they're permitted, but I just wanted to lay them out so that you can see that there are exceptions to this big notion of you either have to have individual authorization or it has to be for treatment payment and healthcare operations, the sort of workings of, the, of healthcare. Um, these are really important. They come up all the time. And um, those of us who were ever in a position of, of um, helping out with compliance became very, very familiar with this list because when it falls under one of the HIPAA exceptions, um, the, the sort of barrier of individual authorization is removed. Um, I wanna actually, Claudia, if you could go back to the previous slide before we talk about this, I did just wanna say one other thing um, about HIPAA and that is really important to understand that HIPAA is the federal law and HIPAA is a floor, meaning that individual states can and do and have put into place additional requirements on top of HIPAA um, that govern the use and disclosure of health information. So HIPAA is sort of a starting point on a lot of um, cases where you're trying to figure out how is health information uh, stored and used and secured, but every single state has its own health code. And many, many states um, have layered on additional protections on top of HIPAA, particularly when it comes to sensitive health information. So very often a state will have more restrictive protections or conditions among the, around disclosure for mental health information or reproductive health information or sensitive health information. Um, and so understanding what HIPAA says is very important, but on a state-by-state -state basis, uh, you have to be aware of what your own state has put into place with respect to, um, to health information and its protections and its security. So again, these, um, these exceptions hold in, under HIPAA conditions, but it's also very important to check to see what your state has, to, has in place with respect to um, exceptions for uses and disclosures. Okay, now we can move on. 
Kind of the reason that we thought that this webinar might be a good idea is that um, HIPAA has been coming up in the news more often. Um, and there, <laughs> given the number of calls that we've had over the past couple of months with reporters about just the topic that I've just covered over the past dozen slides or so, we realized there really is a fundamental misunderstanding of what HIPAA is. And the best example of this that's happened recently was with the publication or publicization of Project Nightingale, which is the secret, and I put that in quotes on purpose, data sharing agreement between Google and Ascension Health. The Wall Street Journal broke the story and then everyone just really, I don't know, piled on and kind of freaked out about what is the meaning of this? How is it possible that Google has uh, access to all my health information? This is a scandal. This is terrible. And it's not to say that there aren't scandalous and terrible misuses of data out there. It certainly is not to say that. But just because this is not something that the average Joe knew that their healthcare company uh, was or health provider or health system was doing doesn't mean it was sinister. And it certainly doesn't mean it was illegal. Um, as I hope that I explained uh, in this presentation, the business associate agreement is one of the most common in healthcare, and it's one of the most important. So many of the functions of our healthcare system could not be accomplished without business associates. And Google and Ascension were very clear as soon as this story broke that they had uh, entered into a very detailed and very um, legally compliant business associate agreement. Basically, um, Ascension Health just wanted to migrate its, its data into, into the Google Cloud. And I'm sure there are more specific specifications than that. Um, but that happens all the time. And so I think talking about, about business associate agreements, especially as data becomes even more liquid and more electronic and as more and more health systems are storing things on the cloud and as more and more tech companies like Google and Amazon and uh, Walmart and um, all of these kind of multi faceted companies are entering into the health space, I think these uh, relationships are only going to become more or less, more rather than less common. And so giving the public a, a more baseline comfort with how data is being stored and used and the protections that it is being afforded is really important so that we can look at agreements like the Google Ascension one and think, oh God, I'm so lucky that I'm going to be having this much more secure and much more protected um, system in place for my health data rather than facing it with distrust. And I certainly don't mean to say that there isn't reason in some cases to be distrustful of everything being stored in the cloud or everything being stored digitally. There are real risks to that. And again, the breach notification rule gets lots and lots of use because there are, unfortunately are a lot of breaches. But there needs to be more education and more transparency, I think, with consumers about what are the sorts of services that a healthcare provider or healthcare payer are contracting for so that when news like this breaks, it isn't immediately met with this sort of baseline nausea of, oh God, my data is being used by Google. I will also say that this concept of de-identification of data is becoming um, more and more, I don't, I don't want to say suspect, but as you can imagine, when there are companies like Google who are contracting with a health provider, the big, the big concern is that the Google sort of Google data and Ascension data or whatever the business is, or whatever the covered entity data is really kept separate because you can imagine a situ situation or scenario in which data gets linked up to other identifiers through the, for, through the retail or search history data that Google already has. And there's the potential, maybe small, but also very real of re-identification. And that was something that both the Google and Ascension CEOs talked about in their public response to this, that the firewalling and the technical walling off of the various data sets was something that they'd taken incredibly seriously. And my hope is that they can continue talking about what that looks like and um, how, it's, how it's sort of being implemented so that this, the baseline consumer trust is increased. I think the next slide is my last. I just wanted to mention a couple of things that are coming down the pike with respect to, not really HIPAA specifically, but um, Sometimes our health information laws aren't as nimble as they could be. So I just wanted to highlight that there are two rules that are currently awaiting clearance at OMB and will be finalized soon that have to do with um, health data. And I won't go into too much detail on these. Maybe we, if there is interest, we could do a separate webinar on the CMS interoperability rule and the data blocking exceptions rule. But really the, the overarching point of these two regs, once they're finalized, is gonna be to place a higher priority on and improve the ability of various systems to uh, talk to each other 
um, fire-based APIs is a phrase that I had to learn when I came to, to um, EHI, but fire is basically a set of standards and specifications. And APIs, um, I can't believe I didn't define this. Application, Claudia, do you know off the top of your head? Okay, well, anyway, I can't remember. It's like a personal app, basically. And um, so the idea is that we want information to be more readily available through um, personal applications and better able application programming, programming interface. Thank you, Diane. Um, and so it, <laughs> I'm very grateful to that <laughs> quick fact check. Um, anyway, the idea is that we want health data in addition to be as protective as possible, to be, um, to be as liquid as possible, and um, trying to get hospitals and physicians, especially those that are participating in Medicare and Medicaid, uh, to make more of their information available to patients through APIs is a really important step that we're taking. Um, and I just wanted to highlight at the bottom, though, not to be doomsday about this, but there's some controversy or discussion over what, to what extent the developers of these APIs are going to be subject to HIPAA or, or will enter into business associate agreements. So again, we've got this vast trove of health data and a lot of companies that are storing it that aren't necessarily covered by HIPAA. And I encourage all of you to come join me at EHI in our, our efforts to put into place some uh, rules of the road for, um, for the private sector uh, when it comes to non-HIPAA covered data, because it really is one of the most interesting and um, I think compelling issues in healthcare right now. And with that, I will stop. There are a number of questions and um, I'm just going to go through them and answer them. Um, again, if there's something I can't answer off the top of my head or with my phone in two seconds, I will just make a note of it and I'm happy to do a little research and answer it later. Um, and we can always do follow-up um, questions. Um, but I, there are a number of, of questions about um, patients and what they can hear when they're in an exam room and whether it's a violation if you're in a doctor's office and you can overhear uh, another doctor and a patient um, talking. It's a really interesting question. And, and I think about this all the time. Unfortunately, I've been to the emergency room several times in the last few years with children and stitches and all of that. And, you routinely hear doctors wandering down uh, the hallway talking about, you know, Mr. So-and-so in room something, something and his blood pressure and his, his vitals and what's wrong with him and why. And I'm always just shocked by that because in theory, yes, that is a HIPAA violation. Doctors are not supposed to um, be in a position of sharing or disclosing health information um, in a, even in a way that is not purposeful, but careless. Um, again, I don't have the, um, the, privacy rule in front of me where it talks about, or the, sorry, the security rule in front of me where it talks about the non-technical safeguards that are supposed to be put into place, but there absolutely is supposed to be contemplation of safeguarding and having doctors only speak behind closed doors. One of the questions has to do with specific soundproofing. I don't know the answer to that, but the bottom line is that yes, it is a, it is a real um, area of concern and something that um, is talked a lot about when it comes to HIPAA in the real world, because it's one thing to be talking about permitted disclosures for law enforcement purposes and the detailed breach specifications. And it's another thing to be talking about the day in and day out of a doctor's office and how vulnerable um, this very sensitive information can be to others having access to it, however unintentional. Um, okay, do we need a signed consent on paper from patients or a checked box in an EMR that are acceptable for texting? Uh, you can always disclose things to a patient patient without authorization. And um, as long as the text, uh, the mechanism of the text is, um, is uh, you know, as secure as the patient feels comfortable with, fine. But again, it's just important to keep in mind that once uh, a doctor texts something to a patient, the, the information that's now on the patient's phone is no longer HIPAA covered. Um, a lot of doctor's offices and health systems use a uh, communication portal that is uh, HIPAA compliant because it is run by a business associate and a tech company that is uh, covered by the law. So that's very often why a doctor will say, no, I'm not going to text you something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to upload it into this patient portal. And that can be uh, much more uh, privacy protective than just texting. Okay, modernization of HIPAA RFI feedback, whether or not it's uh, expected to result in changes to HIPAA. Yes, it is. And I actually don't have my finger on the pulse enough to know um, when that's coming out, but I'm starting to hear rumblings that it's sooner rather than later. It was really an effort to modernize HIPAA with respect to care coordination, but care coordination is such a broad topic that my guess is that it's gonna touch more areas of HIPAA than 
um, maybe we anticipated. And I'm sort of looking forward to seeing what what it looks like when it comes out as a notice of proposed rulemaking, because other than um, other than it just HIPAA has not been overhauled in quite some time. I don't think this is the overhaul that we really need, but um, it will certainly be the most significant tweak that we've had in a while. Um, all right. When one has healthcare power of attorney, like for a parent, does the right to access all records still hold? Yes, it does. And does this apply to seeing doctor notes, which are generally not provided on a patient portal? You know, that's a good question. Their treatment notes are treated differently than a medical record. And I don't remember the, the details about treatment notes. I seem to remember that in the case of minors, treatment notes are not available to the, to the parent. That's just my gut, but um, it's been a while since I looked at that specifically. I, I know there's special treatment notes are treated differently than a, than a medical record. Um, and you can imagine the real world scenario why that's important. Very often a, a minor might be talking to a doctor and the notes, the treatment notes might be about something that has to do with the parent, you know, God forbid in a case of abuse or some sort of mental health issue. And um, it's not always appropriate for a parent to have access to those. All right, if there is ransomware on your server and it locks the data, is it a violation of HIPAA? We were told that as of November 2019, it became a violation of HIPAA. Why? There's no transmittal to another covered entity. Well, again, transmittal to another covered entity wouldn't be a HIPAA violation because you can talk to other covered entities as long as it's for those broad covered entity purposes. But no, based on my understanding of what ransomware does when a system shuts down, I can't imagine why that would be um, a violation unless the company who implemented the ransomware and in, in, in the process of locking the system gained access to all of the information on the system, then it would be a HIPAA violation because of an unauthorized access and breach. All right, I recently was in a discussion with a physician who stated that because he was located in a rural area, HIPAA did not apply to him. That is not true. Was this ever the case when HIPAA was first introduced? Not to my knowledge. But no, HIPAA is not uh, location specific. Do covered entities and or business associates need patient consent to de-identify and sell those data in de-identified form? Uh, good and complicated question, but the, the short answer is no. Once patient information is de-identified, as I said, it no longer um, has HIPAA protections, but the sale of data is a totally different story. And um, that tends to come into a, a notice of privacy practices that providers are required to, to distribute. And uh, depending on the sale and the purpose, sometimes that there, there does need to be more uh, patient knowledge. But basically, once data is de-identified, uh, the, the patient loses some of the, the right over to disclosure consents. All right, you mentioned once data leaves a HIPAA covered entity, either for a required or permitted purpose or because an individual authorized a disclosure and goes to a non HIPAA covered entity, the law and its protections no longer apply. What about a business associate? Well, a business associate again enters into a business associate agreement that extends the protections of HIPAA to that BA. So the answer is they would not apply absent a business associate agreement, but with a business associate relationship and a pursuant to a business associate contract, transmission of that data does not. Um, result in the, the absence of HIPAA protections. It just extends them to the business associate. Um, how does this pertain to research and limited data sets as it pertains to HIPAA and under the omnibus, fi omnibus final rule? Um, you know, there, as I said, there are all sorts of other um, uh, rules that apply to, to research um, that also apply to limited data sets. I didn't cover limited data sets in this just because it's a sort of a layer deeper than I would have liked to go. Um, but I think the crucial point here is that under a business associate agreement, all of the same HIPAA protections apply. Is data maintained by pharmacies in their online systems covered by HIPAA business associate agreements? Uh, no, pharmacies are covered entities, so they are uh, subject to HIPAA without a business associate agreement. I'm a pediatrician and some moms ask us to email them the child's shot records or school physical. Sometimes they ask us to email to the school. Well, as such a mom who always wants my pediatrician to email me things, um, they do it for me. And I always am grateful because um, it just makes it so much easier for me to print them up at home. But I am always very aware that once I have those immunization records in my computer or on top of my printer or wandering around the grocery store with them, they have lost all the protections that they had when they lived in my pediatrician's office. And now they're only as protected as I am able to get them, which is sometimes not all that protected. Um, 
But again, I think that's up to patient comfort, uh, to individual comfort. And if that's something that a patient wants and the doctor feels comfortable, I think for sort of general ease of life, it's something I'm in support of. Again, though, I may have a little bit more comfort with that because I'm fully aware of the fact that I'm assuming all of the responsibility for keeping that information private. Uh, if a BA uses or discloses PHR in a manner not outlined in a business associate agreement, is this enforced or enforceable by OCR? Yes. That is a contractual violation. That is a HIPAA violation. And OCR would have jurisdiction to uh, enforce that violation. Can you send medical records to an automobile insurance carrier without written HIPAA consent from the patient? Hmm. I don't think so. I don't think that uh, an auto insurance company comes within any special ex authorization exception. Um, and so I would expect that that disclosure would require uh, individual consent. What is the difference between the treatment note versus the medical record? There is a definition of this that, um, again, I'm happy to follow up with you directly if you want to email me and ask. Um, but a treatment note is thought of as something that lies slightly outside the medical record. As I was saying earlier, very often a treatment note can be something that goes beyond vital signs and blood work, and it tends to be more uh, like the doctor's impression or physician or nurse's impression of what's going on. And very often those will be handwritten and they have a special treatment under HIPAA. I think that they are not disclosed as part of the medical records. As I said, I don't have it in front of me and it's been a while since I uh, looked at it. So please forgive me if that's inaccurate. Again, I'm happy to follow up, but no, I don't think they're disclosable as part of the medical record. Where do we dispose of old computers that may have patient information? Oh gosh, I don't know. I'm the wrong person to ask that, but there's some computers floating out there with all sorts of stuff <laughs> about me on them. And so if you find a good secure place, I would like to know what that is. Um, if a patient inadvertently took home a document with a different patient's name on it, what documentation or notification steps must be followed? Oh, that's a good question. Um, my guess is that, uh, that there is a provider-specific um, um, sort of protocol for that. I do know that in the case of the breach notification rule, it has to have been disclosed to enough people such that the breach notification rule is triggered. And again, I don't have that in front of me, but it's not one person. It's more than that. It has to be a larger violation in order for sort of all the alarm bells and whistles to go off. So my guess is that the doctor is called and the doctor has, um, I would hope, has practice specific um, uh, protocol in place to address and potentially mitigate any harm that was caused by that. Okay. Um, I think that's all. Oh, here's one other one. Okay. This is a fairly long question. Um, this is about a mother who originally had a, oh, this has to do with domestic violence. All right. Um, it's a disagreement between parents trying to have access to records. Um, yeah, I think that this is a <laughs> complicated situation. This is about parental access to uh, medical records in the case of um, a potential domestic violence. Uh, to, um, oh, I'm sorry. We're having. Oh, I, I, this is a, a complicated question having to do with child insurance and two parents who are who are. Um, requesting access to uh, medical records. And that is very complicated. And there are all sorts of uh, detailed provisions into in HIPAA with respect to, um, to uh, disclosures in the case of suspected abuse or violence. So um, I can't answer that question off the top of my head. But um, again, Debbie, if you want to email me, I'm happy to follow up with you directly because there's certainly um, an answer to this question in the HIPAA regs. I think that's it. Oh, I've got some other ones from chat. All right. Um, I thought that the extent to which an app is or is not subject to HIPAA depends on the nature of the app's function and what its purpose is. If the app collects personal data about the person using it for the exclusive use of the person using it, the app is not subject to HIPAA. That's true. Um, but the sub subjectivity to HIPAA, coverage by HIPAA, is not dependent upon the nature or what its purpose is. It's dependent on whether or not it is a covered entity or whether the app developer has entered, it, entered into a business associate with a covered entity. Um, okay. 
Yes, I also understand that if a doctor asks a patient to wear a portable data collecting device and the data is to be shared with the doctor, HIPAA applies. Yes, once data is shared with a provider, um, HIPAA does apply. And very often there will be um, wearables that are given out by a doctor that are covered by HIPAA because the, the manufacturer of the device or the developer of the wearable app has entered into a business associate with the doctor business associate agreement with the doctor and yeah that sort of skips a step because that just means that the whole information um, pathway all of it is um, either between uh, uh, the individual and the doctor or the or the business associate so yes HIPAA applies to all uh, information in that sort of a situation um, thank you I would love to do another webinar about the interoperability rules yes we're happy to do that um, how can a startup working on technologies related to HIPAA get in touch with EHI to discuss potential contributors? Well, hopefully you have our emails through the, um, the webinar information. My email is alice, A-L-I-C-E, at ehi.org. I would love to speak to any of you. Um, OCR is the oversight for HIPAA. That's correct. Do patients have a private right of action? There's been some case law permitting this. What is the current status? Oh, good question. That is a, a hot topic, um, and I am not qualified really to weigh in on that right now, but one of the ways that um, the discussions of modernizing HIPAA or even overhauling HIPAA, one of the things that has been discussed quite frequently and debated quite hotly is whether or not there should be an individual right of action. Um, I think that is it. Um, if there's anybody who um, answered asked a question and I didn't um, get to it, I'm sorry. I'm looking at um, the questions as quickly as I can. Uh, here's one more that came in. If a grandparent is on a HIPAA form of parents who have shared custody and equal rights and one parent takes that grandparent off and the other parent puts the grandparent back on, does the most recent HIPAA form stand true and the grandparent is covered? Oh, gosh. You know, family law was always a very interesting <laughs> class in law school, and um, I would be really interested in digging into the research on this. This is a great question. I don't think I can answer it off the top of my head, but I'm happy to have you email me this question directly and let me sit down with my HIPAA book which is dog-eared and beloved, and I'm happy to look into this a little bit more. Is, is that it for the questions, Alice? I think so. Wow, this has been really amazing. Everyone on the, on the, all the participants have had an opportunity to have um, a, 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 a resource just at their fingertips with, with incredible knowledge, so thank you so much. So, um, you know, as Alice said, you know, please email her, email me if you have any other questions. We will be doing another privacy and security webinar, so stay tuned. And if you have suggestions on content for webinars, we'd love to hear from you. So, um, Alice, thank you so much for that, for that you know, great presentation. Well, thank and, you all and for being so engaged. That was great. Um, all right. Well, have a good rest of your afternoon, everyone. Bye.